Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and get started on the session. Uh, this is our panel on uh, natural user interfaces. Um, we have four great panelists with us today. We've got Mary Chwinski, who's our research area manager. Um, she's also got so many contributions to this field. Um, I, if I were to sit here and list them all, you'd, we'd be sitting here all day. <laughs> um, Mark Bolas is also with us, and he's the Associate Direc Director for the Mixer Lab at the Institute for Creative Technologies at the University of Southern California. We also have Justine Cassell, <laughs> Hi, Justine. Um, and she's Director for the Human Computer Interaction Institute at the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University. And on the end, we have Daniel Wigdor. Uh, Daniel is a uh, faculty at the University of Toronto and a very a former Microsoft employee and a deep thinker on Nui. In fact, he has a book that's just come out called uh, Brave Nui World, so you might want to check that out on Amazon. And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to the panel, let them get started. With Each one of them is going to give some brief remarks, and then we expect a fully interactive session from each one of you to contribute to uh, this. Um, so go ahead, Mary. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that kind introduction, Kristen. Okay, well, um, I'm going to do something that there actually has been a precedent of before, and Chi-92, Marilyn Tremaine did this, and it worked really well, so I'm going to give it a try. Um, you know, I have an issue <laughs> with the term Nui, <laughs> which is, you know, what, you know, natural user interfaces? I mean, seriously, like, what kind of user interfaces do you think we've been shooting for for the last 25 years? You know, do you think the desktop metaphor, you know, was created so it would be unrealistic to us? Or icons, you know, you think all the research we did around icons was to make them so no one could recognize them? Uh, you know, in the 25 years we've been waiting for speech technology to emerge in human computer inter interaction, you think all that research uh, was so it would be harder to understand the speech or to recognize it? And how about all the font uh, research we've been doing? Uh, I, I'm sure no one reads on their displays anymore. No one buys reading devices. And video conferencing, I'm sure that's gotten in the way of anybody having distributed teams. And all this user modeling, you know, it's making the UI so much less personalized. So natural user interfaces I have a little issue with. I mean, it seems dicey to me, right? I mean, some researchers seem to have taken this term and like really milked it for all it was worth. You know what I mean? I mean. I won't mention any names, but it just seems like some people are really trying to, you know, get the most they can out of calling what we've been doing for the last 30 years natural. You know, and I think that really just because we finally are at the point where we can bring some of these ideas to reality doesn't mean there's anything new going on. So I'm actually taking issue with the, ter the term that it's new, not that it's natural. I mean, if we go back to Kai 1984, we had things like put that there, right? Let's see if I can find that video. Actually, maybe find it over here easier. Ah. Uh. Why am I not seeing which one it is? Here we go. Now this is going to be, I'm going to warn you, a little bit painful to watch, OK? But give it time. This is Richard Bolt. Let me see if I can move it along. Here we go, OK. You know, back then, it was harder to make videos. <laughs> it wasn't as natural. <laughs> Pay attention. <laughs> this is great. Go ahead. Load a map of the Caribbean. As you wish. <laughs> this is a disc. I load in your picture now. That takes forever to load his pictures up, so I'm going to hurry it along. Where? There. So he says, put, you know, a submarine, a magenta submarine. Where? There. Put a blue cruise ship. Where? East of the Bahamas. Okay, so I, I think you kind of get my Make point. Make a yellow <laughs> sailboat. That was 81. Let's see if we can find 
For some reason on this computer, I can't see which one's selected. Okay, here we go. Actually, I'm gonna move this one ahead too. So this is pretty cool, you know, it's, uh, it was the first uh, video demo where we actually saw drag and drop from one device to another device and to larger displays. It had great audio too. Like that? And a little popping sound. And I'll move ahead. Okay, so you get the idea, right? Okay, now luckily I can stick with my last video now. We, we, go, we fast forward to 2011. This is actually work that was done in my group with, with Andy Van Dam's group. Um, and we have something called Code Space. And you can see where the technology gets us now. Uh, this is for dev teams, and the idea is you have your code phones, you have your slates, you have your tablets, you have big displays, you now touch interfaces, you have speech, and, and you have the connect, are displayed right? In and now when you put it all together, you can do all kinds of interesting things at code reviews, um, like take stuff off your phone and throw it to the wall, or share things from the board across to the group that's there. Users can also write on top of the bubbles Thank you. using digital ink, much like they would on a traditional whiteboard. Our goal is to allow developers to easily bring digital artifacts into a whiteboarding with their hand, switching the system into drag mode. So you can use gestures. Objects under the cursor will now be dragged with the user's hand motion until released. Audience members can also use a mobile phone to interact with the shared display. Users may point the phone at the display, much like a remote control, showing a cursor. To drag items, instead of changing hand posture, users can touch down on the phone to drag. So I guess my point is simply this. Um, you know, the natural user interface part, I don't have such a big issue with. But the fact that it's new is what I have an issue with. <laughs> <laughs> there is no new in Nui, so fooey. <laughs> uh, okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to Mark, who uh, has some slides, so I, he doesn't I know. have to worry about Maybe props, I don't know. Yeah, okay, it's perfect. <laughs> so, I guess my perspective is that the problems we're trying to solve are wrong. If you look at a lot of what you just showed as being the right interface, the problem was the interface itself. We're moving windows and objects around. Those are all things we did so that we could get around the command line interface. I was there when X Windows came out and whatnot and thought it was really great. But think about how much effort we're making, basically making interfaces to the computer's operating system. That's what we're trying to make natural is this interface to its operating system. But I really want to put that on end and flip it around. What we really want to do is make an interface to our operating system and the way that we think. And that's where I hated the word natural at first, and now I've decided to embrace it. Because natural is actually a very embarrassing word. Um, our bodies are what is natural. The way we think is what is natural. Natural isn't a word that in the world where we have to shave and wear t-shirts under white shirts so that we look really proper. That's not natural. And I can't really talk too much about what's natural because it's embarrassing. It has to do with, <laughs> sorry, people check their voicemail in the public restroom, right? Who designed a user interface to work on the can? <laughs> so this is what's natural. We go to the bathroom. And this is where our user interfaces have to start working. And that's why I actually like the word natural, because it's bringing the human back into the equation. Now, to say that, though, we have to really reckon with what is the human. So. There's a lot of stuff about the body that I don't want to believe that's true. There's uh, lots of studies, uh, some of you have done some of them, where if you reach for an object but you don't see the object yet, and then I show you the object you were reaching for and another object that was to the right of it, you will rate that object that you were reaching for as better. But you didn't even see it. But you must like it because you're reaching for it. So you must have wanted that object. If you rate people wearing, with a heavy clipboard versus a light clipboard, you'll rate the people whose resumes are on the heavy clipboard as being more serious about the job. 
we just do these things with our bodies. And then if our body isn't enough, we've got emotions. If you listen to a sad song and then look at a picture of ten, a 10 story flight of stairs and say how long you think it's going to take to climb up, the people who listen to the sad song will say it'll take longer than the people that listen to the rock and roll song. How am I supposed to design an interface when people are this fungible? And realize I'm not saying that it, it, the emotion in the body is changing what you think. It's your brain is not just your brain. That's what's natural and that's the kind of stuff that we can start taking advantage of. I got into virtual reality years ago because I built this hardware device that was a stereoscopic viewer and I lost money on it because I underbid it. So I had to build a couple more and the SRI Institute was going to buy another one. But Eve Zobish was the lady who was going to buy it and she was a molecular chemist and there was something funny. So I gave her a call and basically she didn't want to buy it. She didn't want any of this new highfalutin technology but her boss had the budget and wanted to spend it before the end of the year. So I told her, come down to the lab, try it. We'll put your molecular model in it. If you don't want it, don't buy it. She came in, we gave her this little test to get her used to the VR world, and then we left the room, and I was in the other room, and she's looking at her molecule, and she screamed out loud. She had found a binding site in her molecule that she'd been looking for for over a year, and she even said, it always looks like spaghetti on my screen, and I could see it. So two things happened. One was she didn't need to buy the boom because she found her binding site. <laughs> uh, she did buy it, though. And then the other one was that I actually decided that I had to build these things. She had just found a really important thing. She had discovered something. And these are the kind of problems that I think we can do with natural user interfaces now. We can discover, we can compose, we can invent. These are the kind of things that happen in the shower in the morning, not behind your computer. But I think they can start happening behind your computer. And with things like Surface and the Connect, we've got this technology that used to sell for hundreds and literally millions of dollars for supercomputer centers. You can get for $150. And if you use your hand when you're rotating a model, they've proven that you will be better at the spatial recognition, even if you just pretend to rotate it with your hand. So now we've got to connect to do that. One side point I want to make is how do we then design for that? And I think at, at USC, we've got an amazing game design program, and I've learned a lot from it in terms of what it is to de design experience. And there's three things I want to point out. One is you have to enter. You have to really get into it. And not only do you have to enter, but in this case, I think you also have to be able to disengage. That's the being able to think in the shower. So this is something you have to think about. How do I pull a person into the experience? The second is, you really have to, um, you, uh, what's the word I used for it? It started EN. I had to have something that started EN. Environment. You always have to be designing for an environment. And realize these environments aren't a single point of purchase anymore. They are cell phones and computers and telephones and all these devices. And you don't control it as a designer. The environment is controlled and designed by the user now. And then finally, you really have to enjoy it. You have to enter joy. And that really comes down to the fundamental nature of play. And to do that, you have to think about your users. Some find play kinesthetically. Some find it by competing, some find it by collecting, some find it by discovering like Eve Zobish did. And I guess if I want to look at the word natural, I want to use the word play. There's nothing more natural than playing. That's what we want to do. So if we can get these things to play with us, then we might be able to solve bigger problems. Thank you so much. That was really great. Thanks. OK, now I'm going to turn the floor over to Justine. Thank you. I think there's a confusion when we talk about natural user interfaces between approximating nature and evoking the natural. And it's much like a similar debate in AI, where some people purport to build a robot or an avatar or a, a system of some kind that is as much like humans as possible, to approximate the human to the extent possible, and others attempt to evoke those most human-like behaviors in us, the interlocutors of that system. I see a very similar confusion here, where we're falling into the trap of trying to approximate nature, whereas what I believe the original intention of the natural user interface was, was to evoke that which is most natural, most human, most like ourselves in us. And certainly, uh, for myself, that's where I fall on this debate. So when I look at some of the interfaces that we've built, I'm struck by the fact that they don't work with the clickers yeah. that I've been given. <laughs> <laughs> <Get> the clickers. <laughs> 
Let's try some of the, oh, whoops, get back there. Nope, come back. No, nope, that's still forward. <laughs> Could you help me move this backwards? No, nope, that's forward still. <laughs> How about I try escaping and starting it up again? Okay. Okay, let's try that again. It's evoked my most natural behaviors. Shit. <laughs> Okay, so when I look at a lot of the interfaces around us, they do an excellent job at seeing and a terrible job at interpreting. That is, they conflate those two kinds of activities. And I find that this is a lesson that I teach my students over and over again. We see and then we interpret. Don't confuse the two. The connect, for example, just to pick a random example, throughout the demo fest yesterday, was advertised as understanding natural behaviors. Well, it sees gestures and nonverbal, other kinds of nonverbal behaviors. It sees head nods and large gestures versus small gestures and big pitch excursies and mutual gaze between me and the system, smiles. But that connect has no ability to interpret those behaviors as carrying particular functions, which they do. And in order to get from the behavior to the function, you need to have some sense of meaning. And that meaning is carried by a notion of the individual, which these systems do not have. But things like coordination or building common ground or reciprocal appreciation or avoiding face threat, which are particular kinds of conversational functions, are likewise meaningless unless we look at them in the context of interaction. And once again, the connect seems to have an uber autonomous vision of reality, where there are single humans suspended in space. There are not humans who engage in collaboration with others, who attend to issues of whether we are familiar or strangers, who attend to issues of power, and solidarity. And to move from function to interactional effect, we need to have a notion of interlocutor, of the dyad, not just of the autonomous individual, but of the individual in an interpersonal context. And of course, none of these things works or is meaningful at all without that old AI notion of goal. Why do we engage in big hand <laughs> gestures like this? Well, in this particular instance, see, I, since I see the glow of those tiny screens in front of you, I may be trying to engage in solidarity <laughs> in such a way to establish a rapport that will make it impolite for you to read your email. <laughs> I may be trying to avoid the face threat of seeming boring to myself by seeing your non-response to me. And that goal of rapport is carried by those conversational strategies, which are in turn brought to my interlocutors through my verbal and nonverbal movements. Um, for the last three months or so, I've been watching these fabulous videos of extremely disengaged students. I've been, wa I've been working with Job Corps which is a uh, government-funded program to bring school leavers, at-risk school leavers, back to school to get their GED or to get vocational training. They are the ur-disengaged student. They don't want to be there, but they receive a good salary to be in the classroom. And when I talked to Job Corps, they said that they had a problem, which was the teachers can assess disengagement easily, and have all kinds of strategies to re-engage, but increasingly they're putting these students in front of tutoring software, and the software has no ability to recognize disengagement or to um, provoke re-engagement. Could I help? Well, it actually turns out that that's not the case at all. That's the story that they're telling themselves. Because what I see is they have immediately interpreted small gestures, lack of mutual gaze, lack of smiles as disengagement, the administrators have. The teachers, on the other hand, when there are few smiles, little mutual gaze, tiny gestures, say things like, 
did you even do any of your work for today's assignment? Which is not exactly re-engaging. They lean back and say, OK, we have another 20 minutes of this. Not exactly re-engaging. On the other hand, when the students make huge head nods and big gestures and big excursies of pitch and say things like, help, which one of our students does and the, teachers, the tutor says, why, why, what's going on? Camera, says the student. And the teacher says, oh, don't worry. I myself had to be on camera, not just in this instance where these researchers from Carnegie Mellon are looking at nonverbal behavior and how I re-engage you, in case we thought that Dobcor had not told them exactly what we were studying, therefore obliterating any use we can ever make of these data. But it was interesting to find that out. These researchers are only interested in your nonverbal behavior and how I re-engage you on camera. Don't be worried. <laughs> said the tutor. <laughs> and that teacher reached literally into the student's space, used self-disclosure, used big smiles, used everything she had at her command to help that student learn. These are the things we do with our real bodies in real interactions, in real communities of practice, in the real world to achieve real goals. It's too dangerous as the designer of a connect to look down and say, ooh, I have hands, cool. I know I'll recognize hands, because everyone has hands, and so everybody probably uses them. We can make gestural languages, a la 1984. We can make new gestural languages. That's the seduction of the all-seeing researcher who looks down from her head on top of her shoulders and says, feet, I could recognize feet. Be wary, all of us, as we design these interfaces, of a feeling that our observation paints an accurate picture of the world. That is the Kantian um, uh, fallacy of constitutive versus regulative rules. That is the fallacy that there is an objective world that I can see. Instead, go inside those situations that you are building so-called natural user interfaces for and try and see them from the inside out. Try and interpret that link between behavior and function and interactional goal and goal in the real world from the um, emic perspective of the people engaging in those actions so that those rules that we build into our interfaces can equate to the rules of the people that we're building for. I'm going to stop there. Okay. Thanks, Justine. Okay, last but not least, this is Daniel Wigdar. We'll uh, give us our last, and then we'll go to questions. So start having them ready, and if you don't, I've already got a set I'd like to ask them as well. So you've seen my picture already from Mary's slides. <laughs> <laughs> Mugshot. So I, I saw Mary when she was prepping her deck, and I saw my face flash by on her slide, and I said, was that my face on your slide? And I, was, I had in my notes here, thank Mary, <laughs> for things to say at the beginning of the talk. Um, it only matters whether they spell your name right, not what There you go. You. All, all, all plugging is good no, plugging. No so so uh, thank you very much to everyone. And I certainly agree um, with many of what the things that have been said already. Certainly a natural user interface is something that is exciting to all of us. But it definitely is not just a copy of stuff that has happened before. And it also is not trying to evoke a person in the form of the machine. And to the point of the keynote yesterday, it certainly is not emergent just from the sake of doing new sensing. So in fact, what it is that we were trying to do, and what, when uh, Chris asked me to present only a single slide, although I didn't know that we could break that rule when we were <laughs> presenting our, our presentations here, to come up with how, how would you put your, your stamp on the NUI and express it uh, exactly the way you think of it, this is what, uh, this is what immediately came to mind. So we hear natural user interface, 
we hear that term, and there's a belief that we are in somehow copying nature or that we are looking to nature for lessons to teach us. And in fact, that is not at all what we were trying to do when I was the user experience architect of the Microsoft Surface or the new e architect for the Entertainment and Devices division. The point was that we wanted our users to have a feeling. And the feeling we were trying to have in our users was the way that Itzhak Perlman feels when he holds a violin. The way that Tiger Woods used to feel when he held a golf club. <laughs> I need to watch more sports. All my exam Michael Jordan and a basketball. You know, I need, I need a new basketball player. Um, so this is about the design goal. This is the feeling that we want our users to have. Now, the use of the term natural and the, the term Nui is a branding exercise, and it was meant as a tool. Now, it's certainly a dangerous tool, and I'll tell you very uh, briefly about an experience I had while I was working on Surface. Design a very simple interface that has in the middle of the screen a button, and bring a participant in to run this experiment, have them grab the mouse, move the mouse pointer over the button, and click, and nothing happens. And you ask them, why did nothing happen? And they'll say, oh, well, the software must have crashed or the, uh, something is going to happen and I just don't know, or it hasn't happened yet, or something did happen and I don't know what it is. If you give them exactly the same user interface, but instead of using a mouse, it's a touch screen and they touch the screen and nothing happens, what do they do? What would you do? Touch it again, and when that doesn't work, you would touch it harder, right? <laughs> Just like the kid was on the touch screen on the back of my chair on an Air Canada flight that led me to the conclusion that we have a feedback problem. Now this led us to design a system that gave feedback to the users that was uh, helping them to understand why they were getting different results than what they were expecting. And we called that system No Touch Left Behind. Now the way that that was visually manifest, this is what happens when you let Canadians name things at Microsoft. <laughs> the, the effect of this was and the, the manifestation of this in the implementation was a bunch of little sparkles that come out of your finger when you touch the surface. Who has seen the little sparkles come out of your fingers when you touch the surface before? So that's the no touch left behind system. It's called the contact visualizer. Now, this creates a much more natural feeling for the user. They are much more successful and they're successful more early in accomplishing their goals because they get this feedback. But there is absolutely nothing natural about sparkles coming out of your fingers when you touch things, unless you're Iron Man or something, I don't know. <laughs> so the point of the Nui brand within Microsoft was to help developers and designers to overcome the burden that came before of believing that we would just have the same user interfaces for these new technologies, and to empower them within their teams and with their leadership and in their design processes to design fundamentally new user interfaces that lead to that conclusion of naturalness in the user. And that's what we meant when we used the term. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to turn the house lights up if you wouldn't mind because the audience is going to be, uh, participation is required for this particular session. Thank you very much. Um, so what I'd like you to do is, uh, if you formulate your questions, go ahead and raise your hand. There are uh, mics at either side. So if you want to raise your hand uh, to be picked on, just, just raise it up. Um, while we're waiting, I actually have a couple of questions I want to just ping at you really quickly while you guys are formulating your questions. Um, you know, I've... I've noticed, I, I think you brought this up, Daniel, uh, but I think it's, it's really a question for the whole panel. I've done a lot of work in sensors over the years, and sensing uh, is now built into virtually everything that we do, whether it's refrigerators or our, our TVs, our cars, they now have all these sensors built in. And I wanted to get kind of hear from you what you thought, that, how that impacted naturalness. Do you think that has any kind of beneficial impact on it? Well, I think now we can use the, the symphony of sensors to do a lot of really cool things with machine learning in terms of modeling the user. And Justine and I were actually talking over breakfast about some really cool research that you can do now looking at interpersonal social behavior and what roles people are playing based on, you know, models of the face, detecting head nods and shakes, mimicry in the voice, and stuff like that, which we call honest signals. Um, there's so much information embedded in those kinds of signals that you know the the interaction between a robot and a human or two humans can be interpreted and and fed back to you in interesting ways so there's 
tons of untouched territory in this space. But I would say there's a danger, too, uh, to be a little provocative about it. I think putting sensors into the devices we build is like giving a cochlear implant to somebody who has been an adult who's been deaf from birth. What they get is acoustic signals without meaning. Mm. And sensors, likewise, are just throwing frequencies at us. And unless we have a way of understanding them through learning on the basis of annotated real social behavior or through some other means, then those sensors can mislead us. Yeah, if I may, well, the whole concept of a sensor and a signal leads us into trouble, I think. It, it gets you, you start thinking of it as being, there's, there's the input mechanism, it's the human, and I have to sense him, and now I have the data. And it isn't at all, it, it, the, the example gives pretty, it's not, that's not the data we want. We want intent and meaning. And in fact, the honest signals term, it's the um, MIT. Uh, Sandy yeah, Petland. Sandy yeah, Petland. Yeah, I don't like that term because I don't want it to even be thought of as a signal. Signal to me is signal processing. It's a waveform. It's this, it's this engineering artifact that shouldn't be in an interface way of looking at things. It actually comes out of the biology literature, but I understand your point. <laughs> so what would be a, what would be a bio word we could use that would, that would get it out of the domain of engineering well, signals? Actually, speak? what we're detecting are emotions, for instance, and that's very human, so, yeah. But you're detecting behaviors and interpreting them through a cultural right. lens as specific emotions. Right. And of course, the that point where you take a particular set of behaviors, such as smiles or frowns or scrunched eyebrows, and say that is an instance of happiness or sadness or frustration, is deeply culturally mediated and therefore a dangerous segue. Well, without human input, yes, human <laughs> absolutely. Input. Well, I would say, you know, when we're, we're thinking about what is the language that we be communicating with these things, and there's an assumption that because the devices are going to become more sensitive, that the meanings will continue to be the same as we express to each other in, in social interaction. And that, that is exactly the opposite of my, my belief in this space, which is that your expectations in interacting with a machine machine are not formed by your expectations you have when interacting with a person, but instead are formed by the form of the machine, the interface, the hardware, the, whatever, the affordance, to use the Gibsonian term, right? And so I think the focus in Nui on sensing is, is one step too late in the conversation. First it has to be, how do you form the right expectations for behaviors and induce those behaviors in the users and help them to understand the responses? Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, we've heard a lot about Surface, we've heard a lot about Connect. Which of these would you say wins the Nui Award? <laughs> what, what kind of award is this? <laughs> <laughs> I Good love that. question. <laughs> Let's reformulate the question. <laughs> just, um, I have to agree. I mean, I, I'm being provocative. I really am. Because, it, you know, the way in which I look at Nui is I think that uh, it's the interface that leaves no one behind. And certainly that's something that marketing has, uh, has pitched the connect as, right, is something that leaves no one behind. But, but what is it they're really saying? Are, are they saying that, for instance, there's some segment of people who didn't find the previous metaphors for interaction good, and so therefore they've come up with this new method? I, I, it's really, that's what I'm trying to tease out, what your thoughts are on, on that particular space. And the not leaving anybody behind, I think, is a horrible thing. So, I, I, I mean, the interfaces should be as different as the people, and the people are going to cobble together any collection of interfaces that work for them. I, I, you go to a stationery store and you look at all the pens and pencils, and they all do the same thing, but we all want that one because it helps me think that way, and the tip's not quite right, so, oh, I got to go. It, we're really, it's, it's, we bring to the interface what it is. It's not the other way around anymore. So I don't think you can just say, is one better than the other? And I don't think you can say that, oh, we don't want one to leave. I want it to leave somebody behind. If they don't know how to use it, <laughs> I mean, well, look at the violin here, right? That's leaving a lot of people behind. Yeah, yeah no doubt. That's a good thing. Thank you. Yeah. There's a question in the audience. Yeah, too. Do you still have a question? Well, I have two. One, okay. one is. Well, wait for the mic, OK, Jeff? Can you hold on for a sec? So the first is just what does the N stand for? <laughs> but, but it's natural, right? Yeah. In, in, okay. this, in the context of this panel, you know, it's natural. And I'm glad to hear that Mark has finally tried to embrace it because we've certainly had talks over okay. the years about leaving the N off. I am embracing it for an hour and a half. That was the <laughs> <thing>. <laughs> 
Okay, they also don't the, pay for your hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that wasn't my, okay, so, okay. The, so the, that was just my joke question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the, the question, this, this relationship between what is it you, you sort of want versus what you can observe, I mean, isn't this kind of one of the classic problems in data intensive science? Yes. In that um, there are things that we can observe but in some ways, we have, we have to learn what those observations mean. You know, so for example, in the, the emotion that goes with facial expressions is, is something that we have learned through observation. Yes. You know, we, if I'm nearsighted, so if I'm leaning forward in my chair, it means because I can't see the board, I'm trying to get a little closer. <laughs> But, and I squint, but if I lean back in my chair and squint, you know, it, it means something quite different. It means I'm very skeptical about what it is you're trying to tell me. So, but those are, it, and in fact, different cultures, different movements of the head mean different things. Yep. You know, I, I was very confused in Turkey to realize that a nod kind of meant no. <laughs> and this is yes. So, but, but that is the classic data intensive science. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think one of the things, in fact, that sort of leads me to some, another point I wanted to pitch at the, at the panel as well, which is that, you know, I, I mean, my background's in artificial intelligence and machine learning, and I went specifically to school for that, as I was telling Justine over lunch. Um, and it seems like we're, we've moved from, out, you know, out of that space, and yet that is exactly the thing that's going to get us, I believe, to this next level of how we understand, really, this interaction. And I'm just kind of... You know, as we're trying to get to the science of the natural, and I love the example you used uh, of the, it was she a biochemist? Which one? <laughs> that, that's what I'm, I'm also, so the molecular biologist. Mm -hmm. You know, I, because I think really ultimately the goal is to further scientific discovery is, is, I have a couple papers on that, but, but how do we get to that sort of individualization? You know, how is that possible? And it seems like we're almost, we're almost come full circle, if I'm, unless I'm mistaken. Please, please comment. Well, I always tell my students that we're not doing science unless we can go back to the data. And we obfuscate the data if we jump to interpretation. So unless we keep a firm distinction between what we see and what we understand to be the case, then we've done science wrong. I, I had an experience when I was uh, in high school. I sold Palm Pilots. Does anyone have a Palm Pilots at any point in their lives? Yeah. <laughs> So I worked at Compu Center, which is a chain in, in just outside Toronto. And it was right after the complete failure of the Newton, right? And so we're, in order to sell one of these Palm Pilots, you had to convince people to write in graffiti. But the, the lesson we were always taught was never hand someone a Palm Pilot to sell it to them because they won't guess the graffiti language, right? You always do it on the Palm Pilot. So that absolutely has, has been the lens that I've seen um, user interface design through since then, which is that you can try to rely on the machine to adapt to the human, but the really adaptable organism in that equation is the human. And so where Palm was successful was in, in the use of its unistroke, well, use of someone else's unistroke language, as it turns out. Um, and so when, when we, we talk about this notion of, you know, are, are we trying to learn facial expressions, are we trying to respond to the, to the person, I, I, I have to say my, my slider is all the way at the other side. It's about designing brand new artifacts and the teaching the users how to interact with those artifacts. Ah! <laughs> I kind of feel like Mark. How? <laughs> so if you have a slider, when do you stop? Uh, so I watched, um, because I was thinking about Dick Bolt, I was thinking about the newness or oldness of Nui. I went back and watched that Dick Bolt video, and that brought me ineluctably to the new John Undercoffler video for his new G-Speak system. And lo and behold, in 2011, there is one of John Undercoffler's um, employees saying, we can quite naturally move the globe <coughs> on the screen by going <laughs> like this. And on the screen, the globe goes <laughs> And it is clearly natural to go <laughs> like this to make a globe rotate on a screen. We can make humans do anything. You know that old psych experiment where you could make your professors walk back and forth across the stage? Sure. Oh, it's great. It's really fun. I'll tell you about it <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> 
So we can make people do anything. We can sell people the notion that everybody's doing it. Every, uh, everybody is using their cell phones in particular ways. Is that good? And do we need to take a notion of good into account as we design the natural? So, uh, Mark, I'm curious about your nonverbal reaction. To it. <laughs> and, then, and then I'm going to take a question from the floor. I like just being able to yell and have her interpret. This is really good. <laughs> your signal was awesome. Yeah, uh, there we go. No, there's, there's a lot of signaling going on. To here. solve really, really human important problems, the, the difference between nailing it and not nailing it is microseconds. I, it's not in time. It's just, it's paper thin, whatever it is that holds you back from really making an insight or, or, or you know, this man on the violin, right? The, you can't push all the way down because you have to push a little bit to hear where it really is in tune and then you get to, there is no fret, there is no place. So it's, 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 sorry, your expression is paper thin. To then make that paper thicker by requiring any translation that doesn't come from your body, that, that's where I'm using the natural word, mm -hmm. it, to require any translation slows me down. That makes the paper thicker and it doesn't get me to the insight. I can solve mediocre everyday problems like, oh, can I send an email? But I can't figure out a new mathematical theorem or get a song to land just on the right beat by having to remap what it is I want to what it is the computer wants me to say. Well, thanks for all your enlightening presentations. Um, I have one single question which I'd like to formulate in, in two different ways. And the first way is uh, I would like to shift from the N to the I in Newey. And sometime, at some point, it seems to stand for interfaces. At other points, it seems to stand for interactions. And I wonder which would be the best uh, representative uh, word to for, for the concept you are trying to convey. <laughs> and the second way to formulate the same question is, uh, I keep listening to you and, and reminding of the famous book by Vinograd and Flores. And uh, I wonder uh, to what extent uh, these extra layers of, of interpretation and, and culturally related understanding of what's going on um, are, are relevant and fundamental for the development of this area. Okay. I'm not sure I understood the second question, but the first question, um, I think you could put any words, substitute any words in this you wanted to, natural user experience, nas natural user interaction, <coughs> natural user interfaces. I think pretty much, I don't know if everyone agrees with me here, but that's what we're trying to do, invent new ways of interacting with computers and having great experiences as a result of that. Um, I think my only point was a lot of this stuff has been tried before and our computational power just enables us to do more better now. I don't know that in this new space we've really stumbled upon the, the thing that works really, really well yet. That was my point. I'm not sure if I answered your question. I, I think on the second point, if, if I'm not mistaken, <coughs> you're really talking about the cultural representation, right? It, it's, how do we capture that? How do we model the adaptivity that's really necessary uh, to make these types of applications work across the cultural boundaries? Did I get, like, you're, you're nodding. So, okay, okay so that, that's what the second question really is, is because is, uh, we've even, we've each said, you know, that, that's a serious problem. So how do we really get to the adaption, you know, such that we, can ship something in one country, but then have it applied in another country. I mean, a, a lot of times that's really the ultimate question for any kind of application, no matter in where it's being deployed or for what. Well, that's a whole field of research, you know, cultural user interface design. And it's been, being deeply studied, so it requires a lot of work because, again, it does have to adapt to the individual as well as the you know, surrounding culture. So it's, it's not easy. Yeah. Other thoughts? I, th I think it's important not to fall into a culturalist trap any more than we used to fall into <coughs> a universalist trap. In the old days, it was easy to believe that everyone was just like us, at least insofar as it mattered. That is their use of computers. And so we built one kind of computer. And then a certain kind of research um, announced that different people from different cultures were different. But that notion of difference was a kind of a necessary and sufficient condition notion of difference. 
That is, there were kind of Chinese buckets and Japanese buckets and Korean buckets and American buckets. And you could stick people into buckets if you could just see that they were plus something and minus something else. And of course, that's not the case. In the United States, we have as many different cultures as, as there are cultures across the world. And for every single person, if you take a more contemporary sociocultural perspective, we, we aren't cultural. We do culture. And we do culture differently in different contexts. When I'm with my parents, my accent is more um, the Brooklyn accent that I grew up with. And it's certainly not like that when I'm here. Um, when I uh, am hanging out with friends, I use my body quite differently than I use my body in front of an audience. And that has to do with, um, as Dorothy Holland called it, cultural worlds. And from my perspective, that means that we cannot design for cultures. We have to under-design so that people can do culture in using the interface. OK, there, there's one more question for that. I love that. Uh, uh, who has the mic? Here. Ah, OK, please. Um, I wanted to come back to Daniel's idea, because I think it got uh, shut down slash yelled at a little bit too quickly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't think uh, it's uh, that bad to create interfaces that are completely new and forcing people to learn and use them. Uh, and in particular, I don't think it's unnatural. Right now, I'm, I'm speaking a language. And I could just as easily and just as naturally be making other sounds, like saying, ah, rah. But that wouldn't be very <laughs> effective. That wouldn't convey information to you. So language constrains the kind of interface that we use. Um, and it does so in an unnatural way, but to help us convey information. So. As uh, scientists, how do we convey information oftentimes? We write papers, we also give presentations. That works reasonably well, but that's not to say that there isn't a better interface out there. And it's not unreasonable for us to try to come up with some interface that might seem unnatural to us today, but 100 years from now might seem like the most obvious thing to do. Not really a question, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I mean. <laughs> Well, I, so I, I mean, the reason that I picked Perlman as an example is that I, I have the old joke that I tell my students about the adaptable piano. And I'm trying to picture a four-year-old trying to learn to play the piano, and every time they make a mistake, the piano adapts and changes it so that the key they hit is now the one that you know they were supposed to. So the you know the violin is not a natural instrument; it isn't something that that comes from nature. It was designed, and and there's nothing more natural about our adaptation and our interaction with the world in that way. And I think um, if you if you look at the products that have come out of this this design document that we published as the book, and that's uh, upcoming Windows 8 and Surface 2 and some of the Connect, that the, it's respond, the response to it has been quite strong, and, and we're, um, we're seeing it working. I've got to try an idea I hadn't thought of before. Sure. So I consider a violin to be natural, which would seem to be the antithesis. I think the problem is between tools and collaborators. So a violin doesn't have any agency. It's just a tool. So I have to learn how it works, don't get me wrong. But it doesn't have any agency. It's not talking back to me. It's not pretending to understand me. So it is natural because it doesn't do anything. right? By definition, it's, it's natural. It's that our computing tools have a little bit of smarts to them. And that's when I get insulted by it. That's when it misinterprets me. That's when I have to speak its language so it understands me. And I don't totally know what I'm saying right now because I'm making it up. But there is something about <laughs> naturalness to the agency of the interface. Mm -hmm. And if the interface doesn't have any agency, then it's OK. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, like that. I think there was another question right down here. Yes. Brad. Yeah. Oh, do you have the mic? Oh, it's coming. Um, yeah, I do have. Mike. Okay, okay, let me give uh, this one and then I'll come down to you, all right? Just because the mic's getting over there. Please. Uh, um, actually, I was going to ask exactly that question about a challenge around the musical interface. I, I thought the violin was an excellent example of, you know, where are we heading with interfaces? Uh, and if you take musical expression, obviously, it's something I'm very interested in myself. Um, what would you think of if you take agency into account, for example, what is the ultimate musical interface, if you like, or a new E for music. What should it look like? Should it be the piano that always plays perfectly no matter what you do? Is it the connect interface where you wave your hands around and it comes out with music that directly comes out of your head kind of thing? Or, or is it the CD player that you just push the button and amazing music comes out? Where does it fit? Where would new E fit into that? 
I think it's funny that that question comes from you because I was just out at UBC and uh, got to see some of the new musical interfaces. And it, it, uh, the one that really impressed me was, um, was it a xylophone? A xylophone that uh, you, you play with the xylophone player and the player starts to understand your form of improvisation and starts to improvise in that manner of music, right? Um, to me, that was amazing uh, to see a robot playing with a real human and actually improvising with the human. And it seemed very natural because the human just played the way the human normally did, and yet you know, a whole you know, chorus was coming back, a collaborative chorus. And um, it seemed like that was very, very natural to me. What's re what was really interesting to me when I started to work at Surface was that I'd get an email or every couple of days. And a lot of them were from academics looking for free surfaces. And I could just remind everyone, I don't work here anymore, so you can stop sending me those. Um, <laughs> but, but they were also you know, ideas of here's what I want to do with a surface and so on. And a, a, a substantial fraction of them were from musicians who wanted to use them as instruments. And in my conversations with those people, what I came to understand was one of the major attractions was the bandwidth of the communication between the user and the machine. And we focus so much when we're talking about these new interfaces on will we be able to understand how to use them and will they understand us? But we don't get to the point of what are the fundamental advantages of these sensors and can we use them to, among other things, increase the bandwidth of communication between the man and the machine, uh, or person and the machine, excuse me. So you know, this is, this is I think, a, a wide open area and a huge opportunity. But, it, but I, I, Sid, I applaud you for pointing out it, it definitely isn't just about does it do the right thing, but how does it do it and what does it enable us to do? OK, so we're here. Uh, so I think uh, one way to somehow to kind of unify a lot of the things that you guys are saying is the uh, transition from novice to expertise or the what we call, uh, we've studied programmers a lot, and we look at what we call gentle slope systems, where it's a very, uh, you have a very easy or natural way of getting started, but you can still transition all the way to having extremely efficient expertise uh, without a lot of walls or barriers along the way. So many systems provide barriers at the beginning, uh, and then you think that these aren't ones where novices would get started, but they still might be efficient for experts or vice versa, where experts are uh, turned off because it's too trivial. Uh, so I think the challenge is to have interfaces that start from where people are, which is always biased by their education. We've seen enormous changes in what people think are natural in terms of interfaces by the time they get to college because they've had different experiences than the last generation. So what's natural to people is always based on their, where they're coming from, what their education, their culture, not just culture, but what they've learned in the last 20 years or whatever. Um, and taking that from where they are to where you want them to be, where they have high expertise. And, and if I could just add, and allowing it to be customized for the person in the way they think. It, it, everybody brings something different to a problem. So what is a great interface for me may not be a great inter interface for the same classmate I started with. And we're at the point now where I think for us to design these interfaces, we have to let go of the conceit that we can design a user interface that works. I love VI. I still love VI. It works really well. There's, there's no reason other people need to learn it. With Connect? <laughs> no, I, I'll beat the pants off anybody on VI, but it's. But there's no reason anybody else has to use it. But there's also no reason it should get abandoned for me. We should be able to take these interfaces with us where we go. I think that really points out that um, what we see more and more is whatever people learn first is what's natural, and they want to keep using that forever. No, 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 <laughs> if, if I may, it's not that it's what we learned first, it's what we were attracted to use. So VI is a very body-based interface. I like it because it's body-based, because I'm a very kinesthetic kind of person. Other people are very visual-based interfaces. And when we all started out in the early classes, some of us migrated to VI, some of us migrated to other interfaces. So I don't think it's just that it's the one we learned, I think it's the one we were attracted to learn. Okay, so the one who has the mic in the back. Terrific session, really, really enjoying the diversity of opinions. I think it's fascinating. <laughs> uh, I, I strongly suspect that I'm not going to get a unified opinion to this or a unified answer, but um, in interface design, we're always trading something off. 
So we if we're gaining naturalness, what do you think, and I'm expecting a diversity of responses, what do you think we're giving away? Was the question, what, what are we giving away when we do a natural user interface? If we gain, if we increase naturalness, what do we compromise? Oh, please. Or is it a panacea? Oh. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we all agree. <laughs> Let's go home. <laughs> Maybe you guys. <laughs> well, a goal that many of us have, as well as our goal to make technology usable, is to teach, for, for myself, one of the goals that I always have is to help um, underrepresented populations in computer science uh, increase their numbers in computer science. And I think that often when we think of designing interfaces that are, um, and, and some definitions of Nui say this, that are invisible, we're removing access to the machine qua machine. Mm -hmm. And yet, for me, it's an important goal to have users see that machine as something they can conquer and change and hack so that they can feel that they own it and take it in a new direction. And I worry sometimes that the more natural the interface is, the less access we have to the guts of that machine. Another problem might be uh, kind of related to what Brad was saying, where when you make something so natural and easy to use, I have a story from my past. Um, how many people knew Microsoft Bob? <laughs> okay, that was supposed to be a very natural, nurturing environment that felt like home. There was a fireplace and a cat. And um, it was supposed to invite new computer users to this UI in a really easy, natural way. It was very task-oriented. And I did studies, longitudinal studies on it um, at Compact Computer. And what we saw was, in fact, even for intermediate users, the very first day or two, it actually did help users learn about Windows, basically. Windows behaviors, mousing, where you find files and folders and whatnot. But by about the third day, it became insulting and patronizing. And if you couldn't get out of there, you were going to go crazy. And so what I did was on the fourth and fifth day, I switched UIs. And so the people who were using Bob went into Windows. And people who were using Windows got Bob. And it only one direction worked. <laughs> um, so the people who got Windows, their satisfaction ratings went out the roof. Because now they were you know, free to do whatever kinds of tasks they wanted, because they were expert enough. So I think the worry is exactly what Brad was pointing out, is if you don't progressively disclose what the user interface can do quickly enough or at the right pace maybe for a particular individual, uh, the danger is they'll, they'll drop it and they, they'll just stop using it. Well, I, and I think Brad made a, a great point when he was talking about the scaffolded approach to, to um, progressive disclosure of capabilities. I think one of the big dangers we've seen of Nui, if not in the, the, the vision that we articulated for it, but really in the manifestation that we're seeing of it, is that it's being taken to mean that we're getting rid of capabilities. And so people will refer to something as being more natural because it only does two things. Right. And, and so the way that you allow everyone to feel like a natural with the interface is that they know how to use it by the first day and it just they can't possibly learn to do more because it doesn't do anymore. Yeah, that, so. I would agree. I, I think one of the big problems that we face with a lot of the tools that are coming out that are quote unquote natural and they're just really scaled back technology and yeah. really don't actually provide a good solution. Uh, right there, please. Yeah, um, given that everybody has got different definitions of what natural means, this is going to be hard. But suppose I purport to have built something that's natural. What are my criteria for evaluation? How would I measure whether I've got it right or not? And the one thing I haven't heard anyone mention that I'm curious about is user control. I mean, after all, it's a bloody machine I'm talking to. I'm the one that should rule the roost. Um, emotions, facial expressions are really efficient for people, so maybe they've got a role with machines. But where do we make sure that the human being is always in control, or Can does jump anybody not care? Up. It's not a machine you're interfacing to anymore. That's the point I'm trying to make, if I, I'm not getting it across. It's not a machine anymore. But that's, sorry, you can grab the other points. No, but what is it? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. That's what makes it exciting. <laughs> no, no, no. It is. I mean, there's, it's, you know, there's data everywhere. There are people everywhere. I have a social network there. I have people here in the room. I've got my phone I just put down there, and I'm wondering about what message is on it, and is somebody trying to... I don't know what it is anymore, but it's not 
of this world. It's not completely virtual. It is this new synthetic space. But we keep thinking, I brought this book to remind me of it. I've got Transducer Interfacing Handbook, A Guide to Analog Signal Conditioning. <laughs> and it's this really simple, you know, what is an interface? And what an interface is, is it takes a transducer and it changes it electronically and it sends it to the machine. And this is exactly what I want us to stop thinking like. There isn't a machine anymore and there isn't a user anymore. There's this weird clump of users in some weird social thing and there's some weird clump of machines in some weird configuration and I take my phone to the can with me. They're everywhere, right? <laughs> so I don't know what machine I'm interfacing to anymore. So the only way as a designer I can approach it is to say there isn't a machine. There's a task. There's something I want to do. There's something I want to achieve or think. How do I do that? But the question is still really important, like how do you keep the user in control? I mean, you can see all the controversy that's gone on around Facebook and the privacy situation. Um, I, I don't have the answer to you, but I'm really, really wanting to do research on that area because, you know, in the next five years, this is going to be such a huge issue. Um, so, yeah, I think we need to invent how we make sure the user keeps control. But to the first half of the question, it was how do you evaluate whether or not you've achieved the NUI? And, and I, I, I wish the other half of the author of our book, Dennis Wixon, who's now a member of the Chi Academy for his evaluation of things among other natural user interfaces, um, I, I'm not going to answer for him, but I'll say, you know, read more of his stuff and, and talk to him about it, and he works here at Microsoft. Oh, Barbara. There you go. Yeah, I, I have to preface this question with, I'm not a computer scientist, so if this sounds a little untechnical, it's because I'm a life scientist. But what you're trying to do, if I understand correctly, with these interfaces, is you're trying to accomplish something. And the interface is just a means to get the user and the, the thing that will accomplish it, this learning machine, this algorithm that's adapting, this crowdsourcing community, whatever is this, this thing on the other side, is to make it happen. So in other sessions today, and certainly lots of other places, we're also hearing about these huge, huge data sets that we can't by brute force look at, and that we can't sort of turn the pages and say, okay, here's the pattern. So it seems to me that part of what you're trying to do with this natural user interface is to do something that's fundamentally unnatural. And so part of what I would like for you to talk about a little bit is how do you make the unnatural natural, or how do you get people to be able to interface so that the machine can augment in its learning capacities, in its adaptability, and in its ability to crunch lots of stuff very quickly, how does it allow you to do things that have not been done before? That, what is natural about that? See, I, I, I totally agree with you. And I wanted to start a group that did snooey, supernatural user interfaces, <laughs> but nobody liked that idea. But I totally agree with you. It should be augmenting our human capabilities in every way possible, as opposed to creating something that we already do pretty well ourselves. So, so how do you do that? Yeah, how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's called research. So, so, is, so many of the things that we do, that we spend a lot of time learning how to do, are, are in fact not very natural. Um, you know, as you know, in the other side part of my life, I'm, I'm a ski instructor, and I occasionally think about retiring and doing that all the time. And, <laughs> In, in the whole field of, of coaching and athletics, there, there's a lot of you know, fairly interesting work going on about how people learn to do things. And, and of course, it's as you would expect, it's, there, there's a whole range of things, a whole range of ways that we learn. Sometimes we do it by mimicking. Sometimes we do it by being explained to. Sometimes we do it by self-exploration and figuring out what works. But that there's all sorts of these things that we work very hard to learn how to do. Uh, you know, skiing, swinging a golf club, playing tennis, fighting, you know, all sorts of stuff. And so I guess one of the questions in the whole idea of a natural user interface is, is how do we use this knowledge about how people learn to, to let them get better with the, the interface. You know, as David said, it, um, you, you want to be better, you know, a year from now than you were the first day. And how does the interface help you learn how to, how to use it better? Although I would maybe flip that on its head. You're, there's two ways of asking that question. One is how can the interface be an ideal learning partner? 
to learn in the world. So how can an interface be a coach or a teacher or a peer tutor? But the other is, um, I think in Nui there's an assumption that the really good interface will remove the need to learn, that it will begin where you are, as Brad said. And I think this is what Daniel has been saying, that the really good interface will um, obviate the need for learning. But that's a funny thing to say because there might be value in learning, as you've said. So I think we need to separate these things out. Do we want a system that helps us learn because learning is good for us? Or do we want a system that removes the need to learn because um, immediately uh, being face to face with computing power is helpful to us? Well, I, I think Daniel, though, made the point that if you if it's too easy, one of the ways you make it really easy is to limit the functionality. But that's boring. So I want to go back yeah. to the word. Oh, yeah. No, I want to go back to the word play. So I'm not a skier, but I assume for people that ski, that's got to be the best toy in the world, right? That it's the most for, fun form of play they have. So I think the interface has to allow us to push ourselves to the very limit of our ability to play. So if it's a kinesthetic task, then you want the interface, the ski, to be as hard as possible for your current skill level. If it's a discovery, if it's a scientist trying to find something in data, then she really wants it to be something that pushes her to the very limit. Because frankly, that's the most fun. That's the most playful. So really, it's building the best toy. And our toys get more complicated as we get better. There's a whole uh, research community around playability. Mm -hmm and engagement and how you design games so that you know you get maximal joy out of getting to that next level and it's just long enough that it takes you to get to that next level and um, serious research going on on that topic so it's, it's very relevant and as you know I have to tell a personal story here when I was um, seven my whole school which was an experimental school went on a ski trip we went to somewhere that I think was called Pico's Peak or somewhere in Vermont and the whole school which was 25 kids went up to this um, ski resort and we were given one lesson and then in the school we were assumed to be able to learn anything instantly given one lesson and then told to go up the mountain and I was told in particular I'd never seen skid skis I grew up in Brooklyn I was told that it was really pretty from the top and if I didn't like it up there I could just ride the lift down again which was of course a lie. So <laughs> I got up to the top and the guy at the top said, you can't, you, there's only one way to come down and that's on your skis. And I freaked out. And so I removed my skis. I also removed my boots. <laughs> and I walked down in my socks. That wasn't very natural. No, <laughs> none of it was natural. I was very, very scared. And by the time I got to the bottom, of course I had frostbite and I had to be carried back to the lodge. It's the last time I have ever gotten even that close to um, a ski lift. I cross-country ski with great pleasure. Anytime anyone tells me to meet them at the lodge, I make a big circle <laughs> around the downhill skiing area. But um, I bring it up because of the notion of the zone of proximal development. You know, as a teacher, that you don't set a task that's 25 steps from where your learner is. You set a task that's one step. This is what my ski instructors seem not to have, um, <laughs> not to have known for someone who's only ever walked, and even that for seven years, <laughs> your five years or however long you walk for. You don't stick them on a, um, a set of skis. Likewise, for interfaces, if we want to take advantage of the power of computing, and Mark was having a hard time understanding what we're interfacing to. And I think this gets back to an earlier question um, as to whether we're talking about an interface or an interaction. Mm -hmm. And increasingly, I think we are building interfaces to interaction with power. Computing power, yeah. human power, mixtures of human and computing power. And the way to bootstrap people into that is perhaps to have an interface that starts almost where they are and then scaffold them into that thing that's harder. And I think natural user interfaces can also do that. Well, and, and where we, we drew that from is exactly what Mary was speaking of. Dennis's background is in, um, among others, testing for game design and game playability. And in, in that field, I mean, I, you know, it completely opened my eyes when I learned that the first few seconds of, of Super Mario Brothers is to teach you how to jump and then to teach you how to run and jump. And 
you know, and, and it's, it's exactly from those places that we can get that. And I think that there are um, a lot of areas where they've been doing innovation and design that we can draw from to, to get there without it having to be about adaptability. Okay, the, uh, before I, I go to the next question, I just, there's one thing I want to call out about the, what you said, Justine, and maybe you can clarify it for me as well, which is, it seems very much like there's a sense of natural about me, and then there's a sense of natural about the task. And really, when you think about it that way, really it's how do we do the task very well, rather than dumbing down the system and, that we're interacting with. But meanwhile, how do we make sure that it's relevant to me specifically, me individually, me emotionally. But I, I just want to clarify, that's where you're headed with that. Yep, yep. and I think that, that links up to what Mary was saying about the snooey. Oh yeah, that a I good, love <laughs> Right. I'll join. <laughs> <laughs> a good interface can make us a head taller than we are yeah. in real life. I, I love that interface, I want that interface, please. So Justine, I thought your answer about your ski story was gonna face feed right into this because I was assuming it was going to be a seven-year-old who did this just better than any adult ever could. <laughs> but, but it still feeds into the question I was going to ask, which is how is our concept of natural dealing with uh, different ages and different generational issues? You know, clearly um, a whole lot of younger people than me find it very natural to walk down the streets doing things with both thumbs at the same time that I can't possibly do. So, and in fact, what we may be training what becomes natural as we develop these things more. So how is that being accounted for? And that's not even necessarily a good thing, by the way. <laughs> um, you know, I see in, in laboratory studies all the time uh, real strong generational differences. So for instance, people from my generation and older can focus very, very well on a task you give them if it's complicated enough and not even notice that instant messages are coming in, notifications are coming in, it doesn't matter whether they have an audio herald or not, they're focused. Whereas if you put a younger generation person in there, that is not the case at all. They will be distracted immediately. Um, and I notice this again and again and again. Um, and what we know from brain studies is the fact that they are so uh, prone to multitasking and task switching like that is actually not good. They're not using the, the frontal portions of their brain, the executive decision making centers, and they're not processing the information as deeply and making the associations they should be making. And so just because we're training a new generation to do something differently doesn't mean it's a good thing. I just wanted to put that out there. I don't know if I have an answer for your question, but I think we should be careful what we train. Some of us still can drive a stick shift. <laughs> yeah, some of us only, only have cars that have stick shifts. <laughs> Well, actually, I, w I really want to thank all of you for participating with us today. We're getting clo to the close of the time, and I'm, I'm really pleased and, and amazed that the four of you didn't get into a knockdown drag out brawl. I, I purposely picked the, the <laughs> and there may be a fight afterwards, so uh, stay tuned for the cruise, you know, and some of you might get shoved overboard. So I highly encourage you to go to the cruise t this evening. But, um, but uh, really, uh, more importantly, I, I'm, I, it was a great interaction with you and uh, a great interaction with all of you, and I want to thank you very much and, uh, for, for sharing your knowledge with us about natural. Um, I really seriously enjoyed this, uh, this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.